You know, I was actually uh, a couple weeks ago when Matt asked me to share, I knew exactly like where I wanted to go initially. Uh, it's something I've been working on for the past few months in my own like head, in my own theology about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works under pressure. And I was heading in that direction, feeling really good about that. And then about five days ago, I felt the Lord sending me in a different direction than you guys. And it's a concept um, that probably is the thing that I've, I've preached on the most. Um, and it's been something I've preached on a lot over the past 10 years. Um, and I've gone back to it a lot over the past couple of years in the midst of the pandemic and the chaos and so much is going on. Something I've needed for me personally, and I found it to be true for a lot of church leaders. And I know in the room today, even a lot watching later, uh, there's a lot of church leaders. We have pastoral leaders, potential pastoral leaders, and a lot of even our own church, which is cool to see you guys a lot of lay leaders. And so I, I think this is a message particularly today for, for leaders in the church at, at, a, at a time like this. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. Um, we're going to be in chapter 1, one of my favorite stories. We're just going to be looking at 3 verses, 9 through 11. It's the baptism story of Jesus, Mark chapter 1, 9 through 11. And if you've heard me preach a lot, you've probably heard some of this sermon before, so I apologize on the front end. But maybe the Lord wants you to remember it again. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. And if you've got your Bibles with you, you know where I'm going, I want you to say it with me because this is what I really need you to hear. You are my son, whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased. Let's, let's say that again. You are my son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. So for me growing up personally, uh, when I was a young, young kid, I'm talking like four, five, six years old, I was the type of kid that, that found myself getting in trouble a lot. I mean, not major things at that age that are going to get me thrown in jail type stuff, but, you know, hitting a ball over the neighbor's wall and breaking a window, not telling anybody, that kind of stuff. And my, my parents, in their wisdom, saw that pretty early on and realized as I got older that they probably needed to put some tight boundaries around me until I matured up a little bit, which at the time I didn't like, but it was a very smart decision looking back. And so when I got to the point when I was in junior high and high school, when I could do a lot more damage with my life, uh, my parents were pretty strict on me on the front end, wouldn't let me do a lot of things that other kids were doing. But they'd always tell me, when, when you show the maturity uh, that you need to be able to do things like that, we'll let you start to do that. So at some point, I think probably around my 10th grade year, apparently I showed the maturity that I needed to be able to do more. But before I would go out at nights, my dad would always grab me, and he would grab me by the shoulders in that lovingly father way, kind of a, somewhat of a tight grip and not too tight. And he would look me in the eyes and he would make this statement, maybe your parents made this to you, he would say, son, I want you to remember who you are and I want you to remember who you are. How many of you heard that from your parents? How many of you said that? Yeah, pretty common statement. So I want you to remember who you are and I want you to remember whose you are. Now, my dad had two things in mind with that. Number one, he wanted me to be reminded that I was a child of the Haynes family. And we had a certain name. I grew up in a small town up in North Mississippi, so we had a certain name attached to that. We tried to live you know, as people of the Lord and people following Christ, and he didn't want us to, to wreck, me to wreck the family name. So that was one thing. But, but more importantly for my dad, he knew that I'd given my life to Jesus at an early age. And what, he wanted me to live into that with my life with every decision that I would make. And i got to be honest with you, when my dad would make that comment to me, um, I saw it as a passive-aggressive way to like keep me behaving right. Like I just saw my dad. I didn't see it as a genuine, authentic statement. My first thought is, I know what you're trying to do here. You're trying to get me to act right, not do anything bad in my life. And, and you know what? I'm not going to put up with that. I'm going to do like the way I want to, how I want to, when I want to. And I would storm out the doors thinking in my head, I'm not going to let this phrase affect me. But sure enough, I would get into these moments, these crossroads decisions in my life. And when I was, every part of me wanted to go my own way and do what I wanted to do. That little statement would ring in my ear. So I want you to remember who you are. And I want you to remember whose you are. And it worked. In so many ways, it kept me from just my life being hijacked and, and train wrecked. And I can, I can say this. I, I can't think of another statement or a concept in my life that has shaped my life more than this one, more than anything else has kept my life in many ways from becoming a train wreck. And it's the question I really want to start with you. I'm going to, I'm going to ask it in a little more direct way here in a little bit. But the question I want to ask you this morning that we're going to kind of teeter into is simply this. Do you know who and whose you are? Do you know your identity? 
And let me tell you why that question, that concept is important for you to know. One of the things that I've seen in my own life and my own ministry, that ultimately you are going to live out your life and live out your leadership based on how you see yourself. There's a great proverb, Proverb 23, 7. I think it's in the King James Version. It says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he becomes. In other words, you're going to live out your life. You're going to live out your leadership. I'm going to do that ultimately based on how I see myself, based on how I see my identity. And I want to focus particularly on this morning, kind of knowing the room that I am. I want to focus particularly on that life of leadership. You will live out your leadership in the church based on how you see your, how you see yourself. When I look at my own life, um, I've been in ministry now for about 20 years. I started when I was 18, way too young. No one should have hired me to be a youth minister at 18, but that's another sermon for another day. But I've been in ministry now for a, a little over 20 years. And what I've found in my, in my lifetime of ministry is that I've found myself in a lot of leadership positions, um, fair or unfair. And I've found myself, particularly over the past 10 years, uh, leading other leaders, recruiting other leaders, hiring other leaders, developing other leaders. That's been a big part of my responsibility here. And one of the questions that I constantly find myself asking as I think more about leadership is simply this question. What is it that makes a leader worth leading? What is it that actually makes a leader worth following? And what I found, probably like a lot of you, is that it's not the things that the world would often say, these are the things that primarily make a good leader. For example, it's not primarily competency that makes a leader worth following, a leader worth leading. Now, don't get me wrong, competency is important. That's why people need to be in seminary. That's why you need to grow and continue education. I think pastors today need to become more competent in God's word and scripture and in the church. Competency matters, but it's not the primary thing. I don't think it's actually um, what we would call capacity. In other words, capacity is, does someone have the ability to get a lot done? I think capacity matters. Frankly, I think church leaders need to grow in their capacity. We need to have the ability to do more. But I don't think that's the primary thing that makes us a leader worth leading. I actually don't even think it's uh, what we would call chemistry in the church, how well you relate to other people. I think that matters. I think pastors should do better about how they relate to some people. Some pastors, we're being honest, are too awkward when it comes to relationships. We need to grow in that. But I don't think that's the primary thing, thing that makes us a leader worth following. The primary thing I think that makes us a leader worth following and a leader worth leading is confidence. And not confidence in ourselves. Confidence in who we are in Christ, confidence in whose we are in Christ, and confidence in what we have in Christ. Now, I want to take it another step. Do you also have the confidence to operate and lead out of that place? Do you as a leader, as a pastor, as a lay leader, do you have such a rootedness and such a groundedness in who and whose you are in Christ and what you have in Christ that ultimately like you lead out of that place? And what I have found today, a lot of pastoral leaders, and since we have a lot of lay people, sometimes lay people, we don't lead out of that place. And so the big question, the specific question I want to ask you that we're going to wrestle with this morning is simply this. Do you know who and whose you are in Christ? Do you know what you have in Christ? And do you as a leader, do you lead from that place ultimately, or do you lead from somewhere else? Now, for me, this piece of advice, this, this, this question, this concept that my dad gave me, I, I've always seen this as good, like, life advice. Like, this is something I would carry with me in my life decisions, right? And in many ways, again, it's, I can't think of a statement that has shaped and directed my life more than this one. But it wasn't until recently I saw this as good leadership advice. For me, church leadership for years was, man, we're supposed to be building the kingdom of God, advancing the kingdom, reach as many people as we can, and let's do anything short of sin in order to make that happen. That's what church leadership was to me. Until I started to think about this question more and how it applies to my leadership. And for years, I didn't consider that. And by not considering that, I'll tell you what I found and what a lot of leaders have found over the years. I have undermined my leadership. I've struggled in my leadership. In many ways, I've hurt a lot of people as I've led along the way. Let me, let me kind of explain what I mean by that. So throughout my life, I have been giving a lot of leadership responsibilities. I've been listening to podcasts. How many of you listen to the podcast, uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill? Anybody been listening to that? Uh, I mean, I've been digging into that. It's been really eye-opening. They use a phrase in it that I think really relates to me early in ministry. My charisma outpaced my character and competency. 
I was given a lot of leadership position based on my dynamic personality that I could talk to anybody that I had no position, no reason to be in through my competency and character. For whatever reason, God allowed that. He protected me, and I'm thankful for it. But a lot of my life, I was in leadership positions, probably ones I had no business being in. But what I found, again, was I never considered this idea of who I am in Christ, my identity in Christ. What I have in Christ is a big part of my leadership. And here's what I'll tell you that I've found over the years in ministry, dealing with that and wrestling with that question. Here's, here's what I'll say. Do you know what happens when you start to lead from a place and you don't lead out of your identity in Christ in the church world? Here's what will start to happen, and here's what I've found in my own life. You will start to use the church, you'll start to use ministry, and you'll start to use the people that you lead in order to gain things that only Christ can give you. And ironically, already has. You will start to manipulate your church position. You'll start to manipulate your lay leadership position. You'll start to manipulate people. You'll start manipulating your task in order to gain what only Christ can give you. And again, ironically, already has. Things like acceptance, approval, love, even power, and leadership. In fact, when I look at uh, ministry, you, 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 you've read the stories just like I have. You've probably seen how many church leaders have fallen over the past 10 years, some that have been huge in the public eye. Besides being rooted in sin, I'm convinced most of that falling is rooted in pastors who are trying to find things that only Christ can give them and trying to find it through the church and the work of ministry and the people that they lead. And they can't do that. I'm convinced of that. And here's what happens when we fall into that trap as church leaders. We start looking for our people to give us things that only Christ can, can give us. Here's the sad, I guess, tragedy of it. At the end of the day, we can't lead in the way that, that God has created and called us to lead. We can't. We can't lead in such a way that makes Christian leadership distinctive, different, something attractive that draws people to Christ. We can't lead in a way that's truly impactful. Because Christian leadership is really not about gaining anything, is it? It's about giving everything. But we try to use our church, we try to use our people, we try to use our ministries to gain what Christ can only give us. We make it about us instead of about the people that we serve. We do that. And when leadership for us becomes about gaining stuff instead of about giving, we hurt ourselves. We hurt the church. Most importantly, we hurt the name of Christ that we represent. And we've all seen it time and time again. And I know this because I've seen it in my own life, my own story. I praise God that he hasn't allowed me to get to the point where I've been an absolute train wreck and absolutely destroyed a church. But here's what I know every single morning. I'm one small decision away as well as you from falling into that place. We all are. And that's why every morning, pretty much every morning, I have to get up, look at myself in the mirror, and remind myself who I am in Christ, what I have in Christ remind myself as a church leader, whether you're a pastoral leader or a lay leader, you're watching today, you're moving in that direction, I have to remind myself to operate from that place. That I cannot use the church, I cannot use the ministry to gain what Christ can only give me. And so what I just want to talk briefly about this morning is what is that identity? What do we already, who are we in Christ? What do we already have in Christ? And what I love about the baptism story of Jesus, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, what I love about it in many ways is because I think Jesus' baptism is a model for our baptism. I mean, think about the story, right? So Jesus goes to be baptized. I know that a lot of you academics in here, like there's a lot of questions. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? We're not going to get into that today. But you know the story, right? Jesus goes and he's baptized. And when he comes out of the water, what happens? Let's do a little talk back. I like talk back. Make sure you're awake. What happens? Comes out of the water, and then what? Come on, seminary students, professors, lay people that are here today. What happens? Yeah, yeah the Holy Spirit. The heavens torn. Holy Spirit comes first. That's a big deal. But then what happens? God speaks. And what does He tell Jesus? You're my son, whom I love, and with you I'm well pleased. And I believe the same words that are spoken over Jesus in that moment are the same words that are spoken over us in our baptism. Now, another sermon for another day, I'll go here, but we're not going to deal with it today. What I love about this concept is what happens right after Jesus is baptized. He goes out into the wilderness, right? He goes out into the wilderness to be tempted. And we know that Jesus goes out for 40 days, and he makes it out of there alive. He succeeds in his temptations, but how does he do it? Number one, the Holy Spirit, because we know that Jesus operates out of the Holy Spirit. But number two, how do we know that he makes it through? Because he knows who he is and who's he. 
Think about it. What does is, what is Satan tempt Jesus with the most? Now, those three times, what does he tempt them on? His identity. If you are the Son of God. <laughs> I don't think that's a coincidence. And there's two big things I think we see in the story about our identity. The first one is this. I encourage you to write this down. I'm asking seminary professors to take notes. You ask us to take notes, I'm asking you to take notes, all right? The first one is this. You are, it's fair, isn't it, Jay? I mean, I took, you know how many notebooks I have in my office right now, notes I have to take? I'm asking you to do it now. Number one is this. You are God's loved child. You are God's loved child. Now, if you grew up in church or if you work in a church, you know in the church world we have a lot of churchy sayings, do we not? Amen? Yeah. We have a lot of things we say in the church that no one else says. And frankly, it's weird when we say it outside of the church. In fact, inside of the church, sometimes it's weird to us. We're just not going to say it. And I know for me growing up as a kid, I would hear this phrase every once in a while, that you're a child of God. And when I was a kid growing up, I thought that was a weird statement. That literally made no sense to me. I'd hear pastors say it. You'd see songs about it. And I would sing. I would think that sounds good. But that literally makes no sense to me. In fact, I talked to a college student just last week where I was encouraging her with this, helping her understand, like, you're you are a child of God, and she and said the same thing. She said, Frank, I have no, I hear that my whole life. I have no idea what that means. I didn't get that concept until I got to seminary and started learning adoption language and what that meant. I finally, like, got what being a child of God is up here. But let me tell you when I first got it here, and some of you have seen me do this before, it's this moment right here. Exactly, you'll pop it up. Many of you have had this moment, like, you know. Now, this looks like a sweet moment, doesn't it? You see it, if people like see that in, in your heart, you're thinking, oh, but if you really get on the ground, it's really not a sweet moment at all. Like, think about this for a second. I'm looking at it from a negative way, but just, but just go with me for a minute. For months, this child has been in my wife's belly, causing her a lot of pain and disruption in her life. I don't like it when people put my wife in pain and disruption. Not a big fan of that. And then we're going to the hospital, and now she's in severe pain, right, ladies? I don't know about this pain, but many of you know about this pain. I don't know about it, but it looks pretty bad. This, this little baby, this little child is causing her, like, huge amounts of pain. And then we get to the hospital, and not only is she causing my wife pain, but now she's causing me pain because I just see the dollar bills racking up, right? Every little pill they give my wife, every shot they give my wife, I'm like, that's $100, that's $1,000. I wonder if insurance is going to cover that. Right? And with every hospital stay, with every minute we're there, that's like another $100 for every minute because you know how hospital bills are. This child has done nothing, if you think about it, to deserve my love at this point. Then the baby's finally born, and the baby doesn't come out and say, hey, thank you, Dad and Mom, for, for you know, hanging with me these nine months and for what you're going to do for the next years of my life. You're going to nurture me and take care of me, and you're going to feed me, and you're going to send me off to college one day. Thank you for all that you're going to do. What does the baby do? It cries, Right? Not only does it cry, but it's using language here, but it poops and it pees and expects you to clean it up, expects you to give it a bath. It is not thankful at all. This child, think about it, has done nothing to deserve my life. Amen? And yet, if you're a parent, you know when you look down at that child. You're not thinking any of that, are you? Like, none of that is even on your radar. If you're like me, you're looking down at that child, you're thinking, man, I love you. I'm with you. I'm for you. I'm always going to be by your side no matter what. I accept you. You're mine. That's what it means to be a child of God. And even sometimes when we're at our worst, even when we don't get it, even when we fall and we fail, Jesus still looks at us, even as church leaders, and says the same thing. Yet how many times as church leaders do we use our church, do we use our position, do we use our people in order to gain that stuff? That we're looking for the email after we preach. Well done. That was awesome. That we're hoping when people are walking out of the sanctuary shaking our hands, man, you, you're the best thing ever. I'm so glad you're our pastor. And when that's happening, it's amazing, isn't it? when it doesn't? What happens when you get the email? That's the worst sermon I've ever heard. I wish you were so... My last pastor was amazing. You ought to watch some of their sermons. I've had that email. 
what happens when you change the carpet? Not that we've done that here recently, but what happens if you change the carpet and you start getting comments? What happens when you find out there's a board meeting behind your back? Leaders who want to get rid of you. And you quickly have to realize in that moment that I cannot expect the church, I cannot expect the ministry, I cannot expect people to give me what only God can give me. What would be different about your ministry, about your leadership, if you started to operate from that place? I don't know about you, but I think ministry would be a lot more free. It would be a lot more fun. I think you'd find it a lot more fruitful. It doesn't stop there. Here's the second thing I want you to hear, and this is the last one. Not only are you God's love child, but you are significant to God. So he says, first, you're my son, whom I love. And then the third thing, what does he say? With you, what? I am well pleased. In other words, you are significant. Now, in our culture, we know this to be true, especially in the South. Let's say, Matt, come up here. Look at you for a second. Matt has no idea I'm doing this. So this is all, like, on the fly. So Matt, it's not going to be a magic trick. I'm not going to make you disappear. All right. Unless y'all want Matt to disappear? Y'all ready to get rid of him? That's, that's another that's just right. Okay. So I, I go up, I meet Matt. Matt, how are you doing? What's your name? Matt. I'm Frank. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. And what's after, maybe except for where are you from, what's one of the first questions we'll ask each other? What do you do for a living? Why do we do that? Because we like to size them up. You can sit down now. I don't need you anymore. What size them up? What You're a big boy, huh? What do you do? <laughs> I'm a pastor. And I find as a pastor, usually. How many people are you? A lot. We'll get to that in a second. A lot. We'll get to that in a second. Um, we'll size people up, right? And why do we do that? Because we want to know, like, how, who is this person that stands to me? Am I better than them? Are they better than me? And we, we see that in the world all the time. I joke as a pastor, when I tell people I'm a pastor, I get one or two things. People dump everything in their life on me, or they run as fast as they can from me. It's usually going to be one or the other. But that's typically what we do. We size people up. And we do it in the church world as pastors. Matt just hit the nail on the house going there. I'm so glad you did it. Because we'll often say, well, oh, cool. How big's your church? How many people do you have in worship on Sunday? How many people have been baptized in the last year? We do it in church world. Have you gone to any conferences and, and, and spoke lately? Like, how many books have you written? But the gospel doesn't call us to that, does it? I, I love the story here, right? So here you have Jesus. And if you think about it now, Jesus is somewhere, what, in his early 30s, as far as we know? And for 30 years, he's done really nothing. Right? There's really nothing we know about Jesus' life before his 30s, except for that his birth, which is pretty cool, and a couple of things that happened when he was around 12. That's it. Everything you know about Jesus happens after this moment. Like, think about what are some of your favorite stories about Jesus? Give them to me real quick. Any story. Come on, guys. Zacchaeus, Water. Zacchaeus right? Water to the wine. Well, yeah. I see where you're going, man. Water to wine. What else? Common the storm. What else? Feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I, I expect that from you, then. <laughs> <laughs> or the resurrection, that's kind of a big deal, right? All of this happens after this moment. And what does God say to Jesus in this moment? With you, what? Well, please, and he's done nothing up to this point. Which is a reminder to us as church leaders and as people that our significance is not based on what we accomplished, but what he's accomplished. It's not based on what other people claim of us, but what he claims of us. It's not based on what we claim of ourselves, but what he claims of us. And yet so many times as church and lay leaders, do we not? We're seeking for people's approval. What do they think of us? What are they speaking about us? Do they like me? We're looking at our ministries. How big is my church? Have I, have I increased the numbers? Have I increased the budget the past year? How well are my ministries doing? Is Wednesday night is coming up. Am I going to have 200 kids? Because if 200 kids don't show up and only 50 show up, I'm a failure. And it's great when everything's rocking. When you show up on a Sunday morning and you're expecting a thousand there and 1,500 show up, it's like, wow, I'm somebody. Things are great. When Jay shows up on Wednesday night, man, he's just praying for 70 and 300 kids show up. It's like, oh, this is awesome. 
It's great when you're invited to that conference to speak. Man, we see something in you. We want you to teach people. But what happens when that's not happening? What happens when a pandemic comes and all of a sudden 80% of your congregation is gone in six months? What happens when you find out that you preached something that you knew that you were called to preach? You believed in it. You knew the Lord was directing. You knew it was going to be a hard challenge. And then you find out 300 people moved to a church, the next, a different church the next Sunday, because they didn't like what you had to say that night. A lot of pastors fall apart. But that's the moment we got to realize that we can't expect to gain in our church, in our ministry, in our people, what only Christ can give us. And already has. What would be different about ministry for you? already realize every morning you're done, you're already significant. You already matter, not because of what you accomplished or didn't accomplish, but because of God, who God says you are. Friends, we need church leaders who are leaders who are worth leading. We need more church leaders who are leaders worth following. And that doesn't come with more confidence. It doesn't come with better chemistry and larger capacity. Those things are good. But it's got to come with more confidence. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know whose you are in Christ? Do you know what you already have in Christ? And probably most importantly, are you leading ultimately from that place? Or do you seek to use ministry to gain what Christ has already given you? I want to challenge you. I, every time I preach some of a message like this, I, I do this. I want to challenge you for the next two months. I know that's a lot. For the next two months to take what you just wrote down, that I'm a love child of God and I'm significant. I, I want to challenge you for the next two months that every morning when you wake up, to tell yourself that. Maybe it's in the car ride. Maybe it's in the mirror when you get up in the morning. But to remind yourself of that great truth, that truth with the, that we received at our baptism when we said yes to Jesus. You're my love child, and you're significant, and you matter. Start to leave from that place. Let me pray for us. Father, we give you thanks. But God, you do love us. God, you care for us, that you came and you died for us. You died for us so that we can be forgiven, so that we can have eternity with you, but you also died with us so that we can live faithfully as your people and as your agents here on earth. You died for us so that we can lead, so that we can lead other people to you, so that we can lead in the church, whether we're pastors, pastoral or whether we're lay. God, you, you have called us to lead, to be the priesthood of all believers. God, we confess to you that we have not always led with integrity. I confess to you that I have not. And that, God, sometimes I have fallen victim to using the church, using ministry, using people to somehow get the things that only you can give and you already have. God, you've given us acceptance. You've given us love. You've given us what we need. God, help us to receive that from you so that we can lead in the way that you called us to lead, which is not to gain anything, but to give everything. And that, God, somehow you'll use our mouth. So you'll use our hands, you'll use our feet, you'll use our time, you'll use our resources, you'll use everything that we have for the advancement of your kingdom and for your glory. So that one day we can stand before you and hear those words, God, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name we pray.